Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and our first topic is going to be overdiagnosis in pediatric medicine. So this information came from a conference that was held in Toronto. Um, it was the Pediatric Academic Society's 2018 meeting. And so Dr. Eric Kuhn, a medical doctor from the University of Utah School of Medicine, Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, says overtesting and overdiagnosis are prevalent in pediatric practice, and the increasing incidence of disease in children may actually be a bit deceptive and be more related to overdiagnosis than that kids are getting sicker. Kuhn used head trauma as an example. The use of CT scans has been decreasing due to concerns about the link between radiation, overexposure, and cancer. Kuhn and his research group looked at the records of 300,000 children treated for head trauma to determine if patient outcomes had been negatively affected by a reduction in the use of the scan. By 2015, the use of imaging, including CT scans, had declined to about 25% of kids who presented with head trauma. The researchers reported that decreased imaging was accompanied by a decreased detection of abnormality, abnormalities and decreased, um, and the, and decreased intervention, uh, and there was no additional harm to the patient. So less imaging led to less abnormalities, which led to less treatment, but the patients weren't any worse off. Kuhn said, quote, the implication here is that we can safely do less while decreasing radiation exposure and reducing overdiagnosis. And I think this is really, really an important point. I've talked a lot about this with adults being overdiagnosed, but I don't think we've paid enough attention to it in children. According to Kuhn, there are a lot of factors that lead doctors to overdiagnose, and some of them are family pressure to do something if a child is ill, peer pressure from colleagues, the fear of malpractice claims, and the fear that many doctors feel that they look incompetent if they don't do something. In other words, bringing your child to a pediatrician and having the pediatrician say, well, yep, looks like your kid had a head injury, have a great day, doesn't make them feel like they're doing anything. Overtreatment, Kuhn says, is driven by the fact that doctors have a hard time not doing something in response to an abnormality that they find. And I would imagine that increases the parental, the parental pressure too, where parents are saying, well, now that you see this thing on the image, you've got to do something about it, right? And they, they tend to do this even if they believe that the testing was not a great idea, they got pressured into doing it. So humans are not really driven or, or, or hardwired, I guess is the better word, to know that something's wrong and say, I'm not gonna do anything about it and hope that you know nothing happens. Guidelines are another driver of too much medical care for kids and adults. Again, I've talked about this in adults, but just not much in kids. Um, an example is current guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute include recommendations to screen all children between the ages of 9 and 11 for lipid levels and for pediatricians to do at least two fasting blood tests for lipids beginning at age 2, which seems like a pretty young age to begin testing for uh, fats and cholesterol. Well, Thomas Newman, another medical doctor who presented at this conference, showed an analysis of the consequences of if you really followed these guidelines. He said most pediatricians don't, thankfully. But if they were to be followed, here's what would happen. If adult guidelines were applied to kids, you'd end up with about 78,000 patients aged 17 to 20 who would be treated. But if you follow the pediatric guidelines, 480,000 kids age 17 to 20 would qualify for treatment for cholesterol. Newman says if you take 100,000 high-risk adults and you treat them with statins, you result, what you end up with is you prevent 3,000 cardiovascular deaths. You cause 100 to 200 cases of diabetes as a result, and he says, you know, that's not a bad trade-off. But the problem is, for kids, there's almost no risk of cardiovascular disease, so there's no disease to prevent. There are no events to prevent. Thus, to prevent one cardiovascular event in kids, you gotta cause 400 to 500 cases of diabetes, and he says this ratio simply doesn't pan out, and I agree. Alan Schroeder, medical doctor, says doctors are not asking the right questions. Medical doctors tend to think that the justification for testing is that the results will change management of the patient. 
He says, we've shown that test results can change man uh, management without benefiting patients. Instead, he says, we should ask the right question, which is, how will this test provide net benefit to the patient? Not just managing the patient differently, but looking at the outcomes. I mean, some of these people, the way they're talking, they can work here at Wellness Farm Health because they're essentially conveying the same message. Virginia Moyer, who's a medical doctor I particularly like from Baylor College of Medicine, says doing less should be a goal of medicine and that doctors should be mindful not to expand disease definitions. She cited the recent change in the definition of hypertension, which increased the number of adults who qualify for a diagnosis of high blood pressure. She adds that quality measures often focus on detecting underdiagnosis, but more emphasis should be placed on the dangers associated with overdiagnosis or errors of commission instead of omission. She goes on to say that doctors are taught to first do no harm, but what they really do is first do something. She says, we have to learn to be comfortable with uncertainty, to focus more on value and less on cost, and address clinical fears about underuse. So um, uh, Moyers served on the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and she's been an outspoken advocate of do less, not more, and this swooping in to intervene and find every abnormality you can through testing and, and imaging is just not such a good idea. All right, second thing I want to talk about, well, I want to say one more thing about this. I shouldn't have signed off on that so soon, and that is that for those of you who have children, you need to be really conscious of this. Um, when you take your kids to a pediatrician, why are you doing this test? What are you hoping to find? What are we going to do about it? There's a time to use testing, and we have some great technology in this country for that, but we overuse it, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about this, the overuse of diagnostic testing and, um, and screening in children. Okay, this is um, a topic I'm going to cover in response to requests. A lot of you have written to me about this new blood test to detect cancer. What's up? Is it good? Is it bad? So here's the, the deal. I did some research on it. So we'll start with the fact that researchers at Johns Hopkins University published preliminary results in the journal Science in January of this year, not too long ago, showing that a blood test to detect eight types of cancer is effective. The test is called Cancer Seek, and it was tested on 1,005 patients with non metastatic cancers of the ovary, liver, stomach, pancreas, esophagus, colorectum, lung, or breast. The accuracy of the test was an average of 70%, ranging from 33% for breast cancer to 98% for ovarian cancer, and it was 99% accurate for the 812 healthy controls. Approximately 63% of the time, the test identified which type of cancer, where the location was, the type of cancer the person had. The test seemed to be much better at detecting late stage cancer than earlier stage, uh, finding 78% of stage three cancers, but only 43% of stage one cancers. Only seven out of 812 healthy people received a false positive, and the test is cheaper than most other screening tests and only $500. Well, as soon as the study was published, Health professionals started promoting it. Only a few people, I think, ever dug into this any further because I can't imagine after reading some of the stuff I read, other than the stuff that came out, glowing reports, this is the answer, you know, the whole nine yards. I can't imagine anybody recommending this if they read the rest of the story. So that's what I did. Um, only the false, while well, the false positive rate appeared to be low, uh, one physician, a cancer researcher at the University of Montpelier in France, urged more caution. The types of proteins the test detects are also found in the bloodstreams of people who have inflammatory conditions other than cancer, for example, Crohn's or colitis. This means that the false positive rate is likely to be considerably higher in the general population. This is one of the problems we have with PSA testing, mammograms is the false positive rate, so this may not be an improvement. Professor John Emery at the University of Melbourne and Western Health also advises caution, pointing out that false positives become a big issue in the general population because the prevalence of cancer is very low. He says, if you start screening thousands of people who are asymptomatic, when the next test after this might be a colonoscopy or a CT scan or an invasive biopsy, and you have high rates of false positives, then you really are causing more harm than good. Again, we have plenty of tests that do that. Mammography, PSA. Emory cites the cancer seeks vary the, the fact that cancer seek has such varied, varied sensitivity for different types of cancer as a reason to be skeptical about its usefulness as a screening tool in the general population. 
Emory recalls the enthusiasm over the PSA test as an example of how screening cancer can hurt people. He says, quote, the PSA test was let loose before the large randomized controlled trials showed how much benefit it provided in terms of reducing the number of deaths from prostate cancer. Well, we now know that the test does not reduce the risk of dying of prostate cancer, which means that most of the millions of men who have been treated uh, for prostate cancer, having their prostates taken out, when being rendered incontinent or impotent, were overdiagnosed and overtreated. So we've seen this movie before. Everybody gets all excited about something before we really look into it any further, and then we find out later, whoops, that wasn't such a good idea, but it's become so profitable, you can't dial it back. Cancer researcher Nitzan Rosenfeld at the University of Cambridge also urges caution, stating that it's unclear if CancerSeq can detect undiagnosed cancers and has yet to be tested for this purpose. In other words, they already knew the people who had cancer in the, in the original study that the Johns Hopkins researchers reported. Nobody's seen what happens if you start testing people where you don't know if they have cancer or not. In fact, another group at Johns Hopkins reported the results of their own study, which should cool down the enthusiasm for the test. In this case, the researchers took samples from 40 patients with metastatic prostate cancer and sent them to two different labs for liquid biopsy. That's what this is called. They found that different biopsies yielded different results for the same patient. Researcher Gonzalez Torres said the research results were, quote, so alarming, we decided to warn other oncologists. So at this time, here's the deal. There is not enough evidence to conclude that CancerSeq is a viable screening tool, and based on the history of cancer screening programs, I think we should be very, very, very cautious. Uh, the medical profession and the cancer screening industry have generated billions of dollars in sales for tests, most of which have turned out to be useless and harmful. There's no reason to think that they're going to exercise any better discretion in this particular case. Researchers have already begun another trial that's supposed to include over 10,000 healthy people who will be followed for five years. I don't think that cancer seek should be recommended until the results of this and other studies show that this doesn't lead to a lot of false positives and overdiagnosis and overtreatment when used for population screening. Bottom line, I'm not a fan, and these are the reasons why. So the people that you're hearing promoting this, um, I think the first thing that you do is say that anybody who would promote this on the basis of the researchers at Hopkins, that one study, I would be worried about anything else these people tell you because they obviously didn't read the rest of the story, all right? And by the way, this is sometimes why it takes me a while to respond. This all came out in January and I started getting emails and so some of you probably thought I wasn't gonna address it. Well, I have to wait till I can sit down and dig up all this stuff and do some kind of analysis instead of just saying, oh, the researchers at Hopkins are all decided, you know, all excited about this, so therefore we should be excited too. Not a fan, bottom line. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. Um, before I sign off, um, have a great Memorial Day holiday that's coming up soon. Don't eat anything I wouldn't eat during this fabulous holiday weekend. Um, next week, I will only be putting out video clips on Thursday. Well, newsletter will go out on Tuesday, video clips on Thursday because Monday we're not coming in here because we will be eating healthy food at our family picnics on, on Monday. All right, so that's all for the week. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.